Open your Bibles today to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Uh, it's in the Pew Bible there on that rack in front of you on page 911. Uh, it's also in uh, the Bible app under the events section. Um, and as always, there are devotions in there. Scripture notes are in there. Uh, one of the devotions in there this, this week is, is really solid. It's from Tim Keller uh, about prayer. I'd encourage you to look at that. I'm going through it right now as well. Uh, Acts chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. Um, some years ago, when I was in college, uh, I went to college in Dallas. Uh, I grew up in Houston. I uh, went to college in Dallas. And uh, when I was in Dallas, my mom's parents lived there in a suburb. And I would drive from college uh, on Saturdays to their house and do laundry. And uh, before my grandmother's health got, got too bad, she would do my laundry for me. And, and that was fantastic. Um, and then she found out uh, that uh, their pastor uh, taught one of my classes. And so she wanted, she, she would ask me after, as she would do my laundry, are you wearing this to Brother Allen's class? Because we need to iron this. And she would iron my jeans and my t-shirts because she thought I was going to wear it to his, uh, his class. Um, but I would go on Saturdays, we, we'd do laundry, we'd eat pizza and watch the Gaithers on Saturday night. Then Sundays I would drive back and go to church with my granddad because my grandmother's health got, got bad and she couldn't go to church. And so we'd go to church. And uh, I'd keep him awake during the sermon with the elbows and all that. And then after church, we would uh, go back to their house and we would uh, eat Luby's to go and watch the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, it was a great life uh, there. Uh, but uh, my grandmother, uh, she had a very quick wit about her. Uh, she had been a doctor before she had retired and uh, she had used a lot of her wit in um, uh, putting her patients at ease. But we would be sitting there at, at uh, lunchtime, typically on Sundays, uh, eating our food, watching the Cowboys, and uh, she would say something, and both uh, my granddad and, and, and me, you know, I hate to admit it, but we weren't always paying attention to what was going on. We were watching the game. Uh, and that came to bite us one time, because one time she got choked on some food. And then we both found an uh, open-handed slap on the back of our heads very quickly that uh, made us aware that we need to pay attention to what's going on. But... Um, We'd be talking about a lot of things, and then I'd look at her, because she was, the way the table was set up, she was sitting next to me, and uh, she was trying to, to look at the TV and make out what the score was on the TV. She couldn't see it. And she, said, and she would say, Josh, what, what's the score, or how much time is left, what quarter is it? And I'd tell her, and then I'd look, and I, I noticed, I said, Grandma, me, your glasses are just uh, uh, dirty. Um, and so I'd take them off and I'd wipe them. They'd just gotten dusty on the inside of the glasses, just really, really dusty. And she'd put them back on, and it was like a whole new world. She's able to see, was able to see the score, uh, was able to see uh, uh, the greatness. Uh, or it, I say greatness. It was the opposite of greatness, the early 2000s Cowboys. Um, but uh, she would be able to see the game. But what had happened was, since the previous week, me being there, uh, dust had just begun to collect on her glasses, and she didn't notice because it was just a little bit here and there, but that by the time I came back at the end of that next week, it had fogged up her vision. There was so much on there. And um, that tends to happen with us on occasion spiritually, is it builds up over time, and, and we fail to be able to recognize certain things that are going on in our lives. Uh, we begin to observe things in our lives uh, through this, this muddied uh, consciousness uh, that we have on occasion spiritually. And it's almost as though uh, we, we put on these blinders of I am so focused on what I am zeroed in on and we do not recognize the things around us. We allow the spiritual dust to collect within us and our recognizer, the thing that helps us recognize what uh, Jesus has for us, our recognizer may be broken and we just don't realize it. I want you to look here in Acts chapter 3. We're going to see an interaction with Peter and John um, that would not have happened uh, even just a few months before this time period. Uh, Peter and John have been with Jesus for some years. Jesus died, rose from the dead, went back to heaven, and now they are leading this, this burgeoning church in Jerusalem, and they have no idea how to do that. They've never been church leaders, never been a part of anything like this uh, uh, at all, much less on this scale and God has thrust them into this capacity. But all they know, these two guys, these two fishermen, 
scholars tell us Peter was the oldest of the disciples and John was the youngest. They are together. All they know is to remain faithful to Jesus day in and day out. And we see that here in Acts chapter 3. Look at verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, that verse there is setting the stage for what's about to happen. You know, Luke, the uh, great Dr. Luke that the Gospel of Luke is written after, wrote this book of Acts, and he puts that there to kind of set the stage for uh, the temple in Jerusalem and what's going to happen. You see, in Jerusalem, Jews uh, were required to go to the temple, if they lived there, to go into the temple and and, uh, pray and make a sacrifice, if need be, every single day. And they had typical hours of prayer where they could go and pray. There was one in the morning and one in the afternoon. This, the ninth hour, this is 3 p.m. in the afternoon. But those particular times of prayer, there was just a massive amount of people that would go into the temple. Uh, You were welcome to go to the temple at other points during the day, but these were just the uh, uh, regular assigned times. Like your job would let you off at 3 in the afternoon if you wanted to go and pray at the temple. That's just the way it worked. Uh, But Peter and John... Now, having this relationship with Jesus, now being uh, Christians and having the Holy Spirit, they don't have to go to the temple to pray. They don't have to go there to experience the presence of God. They can pray at home if they want to. But, again, living a life of faithfulness, they decide they're going to go where the people are. They're going to go and engage with these people. I told my, my Bible study or my uh, small group class this morning, this, this same thought occurred to me. You know, if it's me... Uh, and I want to go and spend some alone time in prayer with Jesus, I'm not going to want to go to a building with thousands and thousands and thousands of other people where you got animals being you know, killed and sacrificed over here in the same room, and then over here you got people shouting and singing and, and making loud noises, and I'm supposed to stand over here with the five, six, seven thousand people all around and, and get in my own quiet place with, with, with uh, God and pray. That just doesn't seem appealing uh, to me. You know, It seems kind of... Odd. I mean, you know, we come in here now in the year 2016, and, and you know, you're all quiet right now. But that's not the way church was back then in the temple. It was a lot of noise, a lot of bustle, a lot of things going on at one time. But they made a conscious decision that morning, even though they didn't have to, we're going to go to the temple, we're going to go at the busiest time of day, and we're going to go in there and pray. But they were also being, in, in the thought of going and praying, they were being strategic. They, know, they knew that they wanted to spend time with God every day, and so they were going to go, and they were going to do it when there's a whole bunch of people around. They're going to go, and they're going to do it and try to keep their eyes open. They're going to try to recognize what they otherwise would not have been able to recognize. And so they're headed to the temple at 3 in the afternoon when there's a truckload of people. But somebody else is headed there too. Look at verse 2. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Now, this beautiful gate, there were, there were ten gates that went into the temple. Nine of them were almost identical in shape and size, overlaid either with gold or silver. This gate, the beautiful gate, was solid bronze. And massive, huge. Actually, one historian says that if 20 guys at the end of the day tried to close the doors of this beautiful gate, solid bronze, the doors would barely move. 20 guys trying to move this massive thing. That's where this guy sits, this uh, uh, man who's been lame from birth. We find out later on he's over 40 years old. And he sits there outside those temple gates, but because of his malady, he would never have been allowed to go into the temple. But he sits there uh, hoping that people in their religious sensibilities would want to be viewed in a positive light by everyone else and they might toss him some money so that he could uh, uh, buy some food and live and eat and so forth. And so he's got some people carrying, carrying him to the temple at the busiest time of day. And it would seem as though this is just a, a coincidence. Peter and John are headed there. This guy is headed there. Maybe things will work out in a certain way. But with God, there is no coincidence. This was orchestrated by him for a specific purpose, his glory. Look at verse 4, or verse 3. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. Now this would have been very odd to the man sitting there beside the beautiful gate. 
Uh, I mean, he asked for alms for, from everybody who walked in, you know. Uh, he wanted them all to give him some money, but somebody stopped and talked to him. I mean, this is an, an exception. Usually people reach in their pocket, grab what change they had, and just toss it at the guy. But these, these two men actually stopped before walking into the temple. Now, remember, they're going for a specific purpose to interact with people at this time. And so here they have a guy asking for alms, a guy who's in physical need but also has a deep spiritual need within him. And Peter, in his spirit-filled nature, that morning did not anticipate talking to a guy sitting outside the temple, but he has his antenna up, his spiritual antenna. He is, is looking around for opportunities and he sees, okay, here's a guy who, who needs help. This is an opportunity. He recognizes the opportunity, and he responds to the opportunity God placed before him. And he says, look at us. And the guy does. Verse 5. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So the guy looks at Peter and John, just as Peter said, look at us, expecting to receive something. I mean, maybe he was expecting to receive, you know, a great amount uh, because usually people didn't stop. And he's thinking, these guys are stopping and they're talking to me. Maybe they're, they're going to pop out some paper money going on here. We're going to figure this deal out. Uh, but Peter, the first thing he says is, I've got no money. So I'm just going to put you at ease there. And so, you know, the dis, uh, disappointment registers on the guy's face. And Peter says, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, he does two things there. He uh, uh, initiates the conversation through Jesus' name. He's putting Jesus on the forefront. He's pointing to Jesus in his response to the opportunity. He's not saying, I am going to do this. I am going to help you out. Just right up front, Peter says, Jesus is going to do this. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. So he tells the guy, get up and walk. He says, you can do it. And now we find out in a minute, this guy's got faith. He, he hears what he says. He, he, he's got the initial markings of a faith in Jesus. But the guy doesn't get up. He does not get up. He stays sitting down. He hears these words from, from Peter, having been uh, unable to use his lower half of his body for more than 40 years. He's thinking, this guy is nuts. There's no way I am getting up off of the ground. It just cannot happen. All of our best doctors and uh, uh, first century surgeons and all of their genius could not get this guy to do it. And Peter says, get up and walk. And the guy says in his mind, absolutely not. So what does Peter do? Verse 7. And Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. I want you to notice the guy's feet and ankles that had never had any strength in them all of a sudden got strength. But it wasn't until he was pulled off the ground. See, as he's sitting there on the ground, and Peter says, rise and walk, the guy feels no different. He still feels numb. He doesn't feel anything. And Peter says, rise and walk. But it wasn't until the guy started to get off the ground that he did that. But he didn't get off the ground of his own uh, uh, action. He had to be helped by Peter. Peter was offering both uh, physical and spiritual encouragement to get this guy up and to experience God's working in his life. The guy did have some semblance of faith, but it took Peter's outstretched hand, physically and spiritually, to pull this guy to where God wanted him to be. You see, and when we are, are living our lives and, and responding to the opportunities Jesus puts in our path around us, we must be offering intentional encouragement to those around us because intentional encouragement expands faith. Peter's encouragement to this guy allowed him uh, not only to be physically healed, but to experience the hand of God in his life in a way he'd never felt before. He feels Peter grabbing, he feels Peter's pull, and as Peter is pulling, that strength, that, that feeling comes in his legs that he has never felt before. He has no idea what that feeling is, and all of a sudden, it's there because of his faith and the encouragement of a brother of faith. Look at verse 8. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, I, I love this passage because of 
uh, a lot of things, but I love in this verse, the first thing he doesn't do, uh, according to the verse, he doesn't just stand and, and test out what's going on. He doesn't, you know, walk around and wiggle his toes for the first time. The first thing he does with strength in his legs is he jumps. He jumps up and down. Uh, feeling this this great strength that has never been there. I mean, I'm I'm sore today. My legs. I jumped on the trampoline with my boys yesterday, and I hadn't done that in a long time. And I am feeling it today. This guy's not feeling any of that mess. He's got strength in his legs from Jesus, and he is jumping up and down, standing outside the beautiful gate. And then the next thing he does is unreal. He walks into the temple, having never done that before. He was not allowed in there because of the uh, physical ailment that he had. And so he is praising God because he's healed, but he's also praising God because he gets to step into the temple of God for the very first time. I'm I'm sure he's looking around trying to take it all in uh, because architectural historians tell us this may have been one of the most beautiful buildings in all of history. And they're walking in and he's looking around just, just blown away by everything he's seeing. But he's also shouting and screaming and jumping and praising God, running all around Peter and John. Look at verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They recognized the guy, and they responded with wonder and amazement. You see, God's work is wonder-filled. God's work is filled with with wonder, but these people were only filled with wonder because they recognized God's working in this man's life. Recognition fills with wonder. Wonder, wonder naturally follows God's work when it's recognized. You know, God's working in our lives all the time. He's always doing something. He's always accomplishing something. He's always uh, communicating something, but, but uh, uh, the way we recognize it Uh, is sometimes messed up, either because we're too busy or we're too focused on a particular issue to miss him standing right next to us trying to have a conversation or him there engaged in our life uh, on a variety of ways. And and he does it sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly. I mean, I can think of instances when I was driving down the road. I'm sure some of you can too. And uh, I remember one time there was an 18-wheeler. Its tire exploded right next to my door. And uh, somehow the shrapnel from the tire ended up on the other side of my car but didn't touch my vehicle. I remember another time driving down the highway and a car was right next to me, swerved in front of me, slammed into the uh, middle barricade of the highway and then swerved all the way back across uh, uh, to the grass ditch on the other side and my car wasn't touched. And uh, if you were to tell me God doesn't intervene in our lives today, I'm going to say you're a liar I mean, there is no physical way. That car went from here to there to there, and my car wasn't touched. It just, God intervenes in our lives all the time. Sometimes we see it like that. Sometimes we don't recognize it because our recognizer may be broken, or we may have the dust of this life uh, uh, covering our spiritual eyes and messing up our observations. Look at verse 11. So while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. Now, I want you to remember this place, Solomon's portico. It's called Solomon's porch or Solomon's colonnade. Uh, The temple in Jerusalem was surrounded by different columned areas. Uh, This particular columned area uh, was... Uh, Maybe about twice as tall as our ceiling in here was how high the columns went. The columned area was about as long, maybe just a smidge longer than our room, or wider than our room in here, but it went for 900 feet. It was a massive area. And actually, the Christian church, when they would meet in a large group gathering like we're meeting right now, this is where they would go before it became illegal. This is where they would go. They would go to the temple, and they would hang out at Solomon's porch, Solomon's portico, Solomon's Colonnade, and they would have their massive meetings there because there really wasn't a place for them to have large group meetings that was big enough, except for this. And so Peter and John and the healed man, they head to Solomon's 
portico and they're being followed by people in the temple. They're walking across the, the area and everyone is seeing this man and his response and they're recognizing him. And so everyone then is following them because they want to hear from the guys who, who did this thing. They, I mean, they've never seen anything like this, some of them. And, uh, or at least since Jesus' ministry, uh, they haven't seen something of this nature. And so they follow Peter and John and the healed man over to this massive area. Uh, look at verse 12. <clears throat> and, when, uh, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Now again, just as before, when Peter recognized the opportunity from the man and he responded to the opportunity, here again, Peter recognizes the opportunity. Thousands, now this is thousands of people have approached them. And Peter's response to the opportunity is to dress, address the people. He says this, Men of Israel... Why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. Now, take in mind the pun that is there, the, 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 the word play that Peter throws in there. He says, you killed the author of life. You took the life of the one who created life. And now, if you think, as, as I mentioned last week, there. Uh, are some uh, of us, and many of us, who have really, we really contemplated our lives and all the things that we have done. Uh, there are uh, those of us who think, and in truth it is true, we do not deserve salvation. But here Peter is offering salvation to the very ones who took the life of Jesus. If you think you've done something bad, imagine being one of these guys who several weeks before this were shouting, crucify him. And they were partying and celebrating as the nails were being driven into Jesus' hands and feet and he took his last breath. And now here, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, is offering them the free gift of salvation. Grace is for everyone. Doesn't matter what you've done, God offers it to you without qualification. And so he's talking to these people. You took the life of the author of, the, of life, verse 15, whom God raised from the dead. And to this, we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has this man been made strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So Peter's response from the recognition of seeing the people. Peter's response is to point to Jesus. It wasn't to say, we did this thing. He didn't even say, Jesus used us to do this thing. His whole premise is Jesus did it himself. It's all Jesus. It was all him. Peter recognized the opportunity, and his response was simply to point to Jesus. And all these people standing there uh, saw this. And uh, actually down... Uh, At the beginning of chapter 4, we see that 5,000 of those who were listening got saved. 5,000, not counting the ones who didn't or even the ones who didn't follow them over there. And so 5,000 people got saved from, from this conversation that Peter is having with them. When Peter and John got up that morning, they weren't thinking, hey, we're going to go down here and we're going to preach to thousands of people and 5,000 are going to get saved. That's not what they were thinking. They were thinking, I'm just going to go be faithful to Jesus today and look for opportunities. And in the midst of looking for the opportunities, simply speaking to a guy that no one was speaking to, God saved 5,000 people. How would your day look different if tomorrow you woke up and said, today, I'm going to be faithful. In every instance, I am going to look for an opportunity. I'm going to do my best to recognize what what Jesus puts before me, and I will respond in the way he desires. Quite possibly, maybe then you would have an Acts chapter 3 and 4 day. But that's what they did. We, we need to recognize and respond. You see, the struggle, though, becomes 
when the busyness of life or our to-do list or our schedule or even our motivations and our game plan and, and, and the things that we feel like we've got to get done or, or our own agendas that we have laid forth in our minds that God gave us in the first place, we end up and we fail to recognize God's presence and plan when he's right next to us in our life. And that results in our schedule being intentionally leveraged both for temporary things and selfish things. When we ignore the presence of Jesus right next to us and we have our blinders up and, and we're looking at life through the uh, uh, dust-covered lenses that we have and uh, we begin to make decisions based upon selfishness and temporary things. We're trying to leverage our schedule, trying to do, do whatever we can to rearrange our schedule so we can accomplish our to-do list, so that we can fulfill the, the, the selfish desires of our hearts of whatever. It could be something as trivial as, as the TV show you DVR'd last week, or it could be something major, something you've been planning for for months, but when you really get down to the root of the motivation, it's still a selfish thing. Well, the problem in there in is instead of trying to leverage our schedule to meet our ends and our purposes and our own agendas, we should be leveraging our schedule for maximum impact. That means being intentional in how we do it, but doing it for eternity, doing it for Jesus. That's why we see Peter and John headed to the temple at the time of day they did. That's why we see Peter and John talking to a guy that nobody wants to talk to. Remember, they could have prayed at home, but instead they went there at that particular time for a particular purpose, being open to what God would have them to do, being receptive to whatever God would place before them. They recognized it, and they responded. Let me give you an illustration of that. Can I get Micah and Kimberly? I, no, y'all come up here. I thought about using them this morning because, you know, Micah used Kimberly as an illustration in Sunday school. So we're going to do it. Just might as well hit them all. Uh, but here, Micah, stand here. Kimberly, stand next to him. Uh, y'all are married, right? Okay, good. why didn't you answer that? What? Anyway, uh, uh, y'all communicate on occasion? Good, and that's a good thing, yeah? Well, what if, let's let Kimberly represent Jesus today. <laughs> there we go. Um, and uh, Micah represents the rest of us. And we go through life sometimes. We're doing what we're doing. And why don't you take your hands and put them up next to your face like that. You're blocking everything out. You're focused on your to-do list. You're focused on what you got going on. Yeah. Uh, I know this never happens in your life. Uh, but you're focused on what you're focused on. And Kimberly, as Jesus is standing here next to you, and she's trying to engage you. She's trying to have a conversation with you. Maybe she's talking all oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't hate yourself. She's trying to talk to you all day long. And I know, I'm sure that never happens either. And uh, you're not giving her the time of day because you're focused on your thing. You're, you're doing what you're doing and, and wanting to accomplish what you're wanting to accomplish. And maybe she's prepared some incredible blessing for you. Like, hey, what's your favorite kind of food? For real, not like. For the rest of us to hear. Today? What, yeah, today. What's your favorite kind of food? Rice crispy treats. They're all about the health uh, with, you know, kale mixed in. But, okay, you got your blinders on again. And Kimberly's prepared rice crispy treats. Massive. They look good. They smell good. But you can't, you can't see them because you're focused on your thing. And she's got this great thing to bless you with, but you're so intent on doing what you're doing, you don't recognize her presence next to you, her, her intentionality next to you, and her wanting to bless you because you've got your thing going on. So, Micah, would that mess up your relationship with Kimberly if you're walking through life like this? Kimberly, would it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> What would be your response if, if y'all went to Walmart together, no kids at Walmart with you, it's just two of you, and he's walking around Walmart like this, and you're standing next to him trying to talk to him, what would you do? Probably hit him. <laughs> That's truthful for, the, for all of us. Uh, if you're a husband, don't do that. Or if you do, let me be there and video you. Uh, but, uh, so y'all can go sit down. Thank you. You see, this is what tends to happen in our spiritual life is... You know, we, we can experience the presence of God from time to time, 
But po- quite possibly because we don't physically see him, we walk through life and, as though he is not there. We acknowledge him on occasion, we pray to him here and there, maybe before meals, maybe every once in a while, but we're not living life fully uh, with the blinders off like Peter and John, engaged in everything around us, seeing the opportunities he's got for us, recognizing them, and then responding to them. Rather, we, we build our plans, build our Uh, 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 personal, preferenced life, and we leave God out of the equation. When he's standing there next to us, wanting to engage, wanting to be a part of it, wanting to lead us to something we never could have contemplated on the front end, that we can only experience with his help and with his power. So you need to, I need to, we all need to, intentionally leverage our schedule for Jesus. That means looking at what's coming, thinking about what is the best way I can accomplish this, not for time's sake, not for money's sake, but for Jesus' sake. What is the best way this can happen for Jesus' sake? What is the the, the most efficient way this can be accomplished for eternity? Because in a thousand years, it's not going to matter that you got ten things done on your to-do list tomorrow. What's going to matter is the impact you made for eternity. So are you making maximum impact in the life for this season that Jesus has given you? Now again, as I said at the beginning, this has been something Jesus has been laying on me as well. Saying, don't don't focus on on your thing and what you got to do. Yeah, that'll get done. But focus on it from the perspective of recognizing my presence in the midst of that thing. How can you achieve, you know, or get that thing done? It needs to get done, but accomplish that thing in terms of bringing uh, eternal impact in it. How can you do your job with eternal impact? How can you be a part of your family with eternal impact? How can you experience your marriage relationship and honor Jesus for eternity from that relationship? How can you do that at school? How can you do that at the store? How can you have eternal impact when you go to lunch today? We weren't thinking about that. I was just thinking about my food. But how can we leverage our schedule on purpose? It's got to be intentional or it's not going to happen. It's got to, you got to change the mindset and, and be disciplined enough to focus on what Jesus has for you. Because... Eternity is what matters. And are you having maximum eternal impact right now in this temporary life? And that begins for all of us with Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you've got zero eternal impact in the positive sense. You can have plenty of negative eternal impact. But you need Jesus to begin to uh, 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 change that around and have positive eternal impact. So if you do not believe in Jesus, today's your opportunity. I am inviting you to believe in Jesus today. This is it. You don't have an excuse. Now, I'm telling you, Jesus died so that all of your sins would be forgiven. And you can go to heaven forever. All you got to do is believe that he died and he rose from the dead. You believe that, your sins are forgiven, all of them, and you get to go to heaven. And now you're without excuse. You can't say, well, I didn't know Jesus. I never heard about this old salvation deal. Now you know. And the more you know, when it comes to Jesus, the better you are. So if you don't know him, now's the time to know him. Come to know him today. If you've never been baptized in baptism, you know, it it represents in our hearts what Jesus has done for us, going underwater, dying to sin, coming out of the water. It's like getting a brand new life in Christ, and it shows the world that we belong to him. If you've never been baptized after you have believed, as he tells us in Scripture, You can come and we can take care of it. If you want to put your life in this church and serve God here and accomplish his purposes here, we can help you do that. Maybe in a minute uh, when the music team comes, you need to come and pray. You need to come and you need to lay one of those burdens down. You need to come and say, you know what? I really have had had my schedule and my agenda and my my own selfish motivations because I thought my way was better and I've had that. Uh, uh, as the number one priority in my life. And I need to change that deal up. And I need to put Jesus back in his proper position. And I need help 
recognizing the life around me. I need to wipe the life dust off of my spiritual eyes, be able to recognize Jesus' presence and his plan and respond accordingly. Maybe that's you. So whether you need to come to know Jesus, you need to be baptized, join the church, or you just need to take your life uh, and reevaluate how you've been experiencing it. We all need to come to the altar, whether physically or spiritually, and see what Jesus has for us.